Hello, it's interesting that I'm following on after Martin because when I was at British Airways, Virgin Atlantic had just done a redesign and it was like, oh, let's go see what they're doing. <laughs> Look at those fancy words. It's all very casual because British Airways, of course, is very British and lots of pleases and thank yous. Um, but today you might be wondering what I mean when I talk about the UX bubble and I suppose as UX people, we can be quite idealistic. We have a view of how the world should operate. And sometimes um, I feel like we stay in a bubble and we need to come out of that bubble and speak to other people, including marketing. Um, UX is often perceived uh, to design only for the user. So it's not that other disciplines uh, don't care about user experience. It just seems that they find it easy to sacrifice um, user-centered features for anything else, be it budget or time or the whims of your founder or CEO or whatever. Um, I don't know if you've seen the tree swing, swing cartoon, um, but it shows different perspectives of a product so how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how it was documented, how it was designed. And it's often very different from what the customer needed. And UXers think that they are the only people that ultimately care about that um, need. What then happens is that we start to feel like we're going into conversations with people in marketing or other um, parts of the business and it's UX on one side and those people on the other side. It becomes uh, UX versus marketing or UX versus engineering or UX versus data. Um, and oftentimes it comes down to people versus money. Um, you start to think that other people only care about the baseline, they don't want to think about anything other than whether the um, feature or the product or the build is going to make money. So sometimes I hear things like, you have to design that multi-overlay experience because advertising keeps the lights on. That's a rationale. Go out and do it. Or we need additional revenue, so our new thing is we're going to get people to pay for seats on a plane, even though that's kind of the basic thing that you're buying when you buy a ticket to fly somewhere. You need your seats anyway. And then, of course, I run out um, full of outrage, and I come back with my user findings, and I scream, users don't like advertising, or users don't want to pay for seats, which is not very helpful in a sensible discussion that you're going to have. And we have like situations where we're sort of like locking horns like goats. But it really doesn't have to be that way. We need to be more collaborative and Martin touched on us needing to think more like the business. First off, if you're thinking about the user experience, it's not limited to just the user needs. You're taking in information on the business goals because you're not working for a not-for-profit or even if it's a not-for-profit, you still have to take, um, be aware of the costs. And you also need to bear in mind any other information, so legacy processes or the technology that underlines the problem that you're solving. Because your user experience is not an isolated um, thing just on the ne um, user needs. How then can you speak to marketers or other parts of the business to ensure that they care about user needs? How can you speak the language of business? I like to think of breaking out the UX bubble in terms of four steps. So creating a shared understanding, defining what success looks like, knowing your audience, and using storytelling. Moving on to the first one. Now, you've seen some examples of how we started our projects or our product builds. In my fantasies, I dream that every project I ever work on will have a UX person right at the start of the conception of the idea. They provide some guidance, we talk about it, and then we'd create a fabulous product with user needs right at the center. 
Um, but this doesn't often happen. And what tends to happen is that someone comes up with a marketing idea or someone comes up with a revenue solution problem, you know, and you kind of go and build it. What I found useful, regardless of how I start a, a project or what the requirements or how the project came to be, is um, holding a kickoff workshop. Now, this workshop um, should include everyone that has an impact or will be impacted by the product that you're going to create. So I'll have people from engineering, data, branding, marketing, sales. It will vary per company and it will vary per product. But what you want to do is make sure that everyone that's important has a representative so that they can provide their particular insight because we're not in a bubble. The key thing that you want to um, come out, and sometimes you'll have to reverse engineer this from the reason that you were given. So advertising keeps the lights on or whatever other thing. You have to come back to what is the problem that you're trying to solve. And really it should be one of those things or impacting one of the aspects of that Venn diagram. Is it a user problem? Is it a business goal? Is it something else like you're moving to a different technology stack? You need to understand and agree what that fundamental problem that's fairly high level um, that you're trying to solve is. I like to go into these meetings with something called the Lean Canvas. And this is probably the most important um, bit. So you go in and you all list out what you think the problem is. You'd be very surprised at how long some of these stakeholder workshops um, last because people come in and engineering has one idea of what they're doing. Um, data thinks it's a different problem. Marketing comes in with a different idea of what, what it is that you're start trying to solve. And you want to make sure that you're all singing from the same hymn sheet and agree on what the problem is. Now, the good thing about the Lean Canvas is that you can hypothesize differently about what the solutions should be. You can go away with different solutions um, for your different teams, but you need to understand that you're all solving the same problem. Um, so some outcomes that I've had coming out of a kickoff workshop. So um, we decided that we needed to address the high bounce rate on the price quote page. So after we found out that there was a significantly high proportion of people that were dropping off after they'd gone through the process of finding the quote for a flight, and then they just wouldn't carry on and buy the ticket. Um, we had a recommendations component at the bottom of article pages on the Vogue website, and we were getting something like 2.8% traffic to that point of the page, which was ridiculously low, seeing as we wanted to keep them on the page uh, for longer. And then within New Look, there was a significant drop-off on the mobile checkout journey so comparing mobile to desktop, you had more traffic on mobile, but significantly more um, checkouts on desktop. And we needed to understand why and how to improve that. So you've now got your problem. How do you know what success looks like? How will you know when you've finished the task? So people who work in Agile, they know that you have definitions of done for user stories. If you're like me and you started off life in a more enterprise world, then you had release gates. You could have release gate one, release gate two, release gate three. You had a tick for all of the things that had been done. And until you passed a certain list, you couldn't release your product. So you now have a shared understanding of the problem. What you really need to do is to choose a metric need to agree how you know that you've completed the task. Um, this example just you know, sort of talks about CLTV, which means nothing to me. But if that works for that particular organization, then it's a way to track success. For teams like marketing or commercial teams versus UX teams that seem to have competing KPIs, you might need to create a multifaceted, a composite metric. So at um, Vogue, what we did was, because the commercial teams cared about 
page views and ad impressions. And technology cared about page performance. And UX cared about our product, cared about um, return frequency. We created a composite metric. So you wouldn't be optimizing for just one thing. You wanted to optimize so that the entire number that was contributed to by those three things went up. This meant that you were suddenly speaking a common language. So for those previous examples that I gave you, um, what we decided on would be we needed to reduce the bounce um, rate on price code from 85 or something percent to 70 percent. Um, for the recommendations component, we needed to double the number of clicks and we needed to increase the uplift on conversion on mobile by one percentage point. These became very easily trackable um, things that we could mention every time as a design person, as a UXer, that we went into conversation with marketing or e-commerce. Um, by defining a common known metric, you suddenly have com um, communication that's less fraught with tension, less um, subjective, and more objective and streamlined. Everyone here, be you marketing or UX, you're probably thinking, oh, why is she even talking about this? Of course, we want to know our audience. That's our bread and butter. But I'm not talking about our end customers. I'm talking about the people that you work with, the other teams, the marketers, the business people on your team. What do they care about? Does anyone here know what it is that the people in the other departments care about? Anyone? What proportion of you are aware of what KPIs or what metrics or what goals other teams are supposed to be meeting? All right. So it's a very small number here. You need to be familiar with that if you're going to get them to care about your own metrics. So people in marketing or you know, sort of uh, commercial might care about the baseline, the return on investment. People in project or product management might care about the time or effort that it takes to build a feature for them to prioritize that feature. You need to be able to understand what drives the teams so that you can communicate to them. Now you've figured out what it is that drives the teams, how do they want to communicate with you? So um, I think it was a year ago or something, we had a very big product launch coming up. It was the very first um, launch of a product that had taken about a year to, to build. And my boss um, came in a week before launch and was surprised by the design. And I was aghast. How could you be surprised? I mean, I wasn't at all the meetings that um, could possibly have happened. I wasn't there when there was a go, no go decision. Um, but it seemed strange to me that we would get to the point of launch and there would be a surprise from someone who was responsible for the product ultimately. And so I went to have a chat, you know, friendly like. Um, and it turns out that they were very interested only in visual communication. So if you had a chat um, and there was no visuals, there was no memory. So armed with that knowledge, I had to ensure that even the most casual of chats um, involved some beautiful visual elements, sketches, diagrams, and I would send that through by email afterwards to make sure that it was, you know, it wasn't a surprise and we didn't have any launches that were delayed by this surprise. Some people like words, some people like numbers, um, some people like to feel what they're doing and that's why I'm a fan of workshops because those people are catered to when they can pick up a piece of paper and do their own um, sketches. You really need to think about who it is that you're delivering information to, how they want it and why they want it that way. It really helps. So once you've figured out what people care about and how they want to learn it, then you start to have much smoother interactions. So um, things that I've had to do or done um, 
to help communications in different ways. Um, we had dashboards around the product teams. So you had numbers of people that were visiting the sites from the different markets. So I used to work on a project with 11 different countries. So as you changed each market, you had immediate information on how, whether there was a spike in users and visiting the site, whether there were problems, it was all available for people that liked numbers. Um, when we did big pieces of research, um, so sometimes we would run multi-country user usability um, interviews. We would present the findings with video clips because there is nothing more powerful than, I worked with very impressive uh, people in the fashion world and um, I'm not very fashionable so they wouldn't take my word for it when I said something was not very good but when they saw like a very fashionable person looking at the product going oh that's a bit shit they were very quick um, to make some changes uh, we also had posters along the wall with design options so we could share all of the ideas that had been considered and where we were going to with a design direction. People were able to leave comments or just come around to the tables and have a chat um, from any team. It was very powerful. I used these multiple formats to share information with different teams so that I can get maximum impact. Now the final step, storytelling. Again, we're all used to talking about compelling design, storytelling for our audiences, but have you tried using storytelling to work with other people in your team? Have you tried to use storytelling to talk to marketers? Or, I mean, I've worked in companies where I'm a UX designer, pure UX, and they're visual designers. And trust me, as an accessibility champion, I have had some tedious conversations. So, storytelling, very helpful. How can you take people on your journey? For someone to care about the things that you care about, they need to know where you're going and why. I'll tell you about a difficult time earlier in my career. We used to have these design reviews. Um, they were fortnightly. Um, I was working on a project that had five UX designers, one visual designer, and there were five work streams with five product owners and you all went, so people that had things to discuss with the marketing team at the design reviews went into the reviews. Um, it wasn't unusual for the UX designers to come out of those sessions and cry, head straight to the pub, or in my case, I was involved in some very loud shouting matches with people that had been at the company for 30 years and quite frankly, could fire me. It's not an exaggeration to say that they were quite the disaster. One of the problems was it's impossible to review every single idea that you have with someone from the marketing team or someone from engineering. Um, so we go into the session with what we thought were the best ideas. We go in with low fidelity, um, mock-ups and then we'd be told oh you know I really can't keep up with this black and white or gray diagram I'm really struggling to visualize the experience so you change it up and you go and put some brand colors and go into the session with some lovely high fidelity mock-ups and then you spend hours debating the choice of blue or the position of the pixel and it was quite the nightmare Then when we kind of went in with just the one sort of idea, the one direction, we were challenged. We'd have to often revisit old ideas that we discarded um, in reviews with the UX manager or other people that didn't happen to be in that particular meeting. Or we'd have to revisit alternative journeys that the people in the room had discarded. So, I mean, we had these every two weeks. So I could see someone, I could go into one of the sessions in January and have nothing to show until March. And I'd come back in March and we'd start talking about the thing that was discarded in January. Like, it got to a point that I had to sit down with my UX manager and I was like, this is impossible. 
I literally am dreading these sessions. I don't know what to do. And he said, you're a UX designer. You should UX your own interaction. So what did I start to do? I started to keep a record of all my ideas. I have a shared drive where every idea gets recorded, or if I'm working in a sort of master sketch um, file on projects where I have more, more visual designers to work with, then I keep every single idea in se separate pages with the reasons for why those ideas have been discarded and if they are discarded by someone, so not just me or my team, if it's someone senior, then what happens is those ideas always went into the design reviews with me. So there would be an appendix or there would be an overview saying, last time we looked at A, B, C, D designs and we decided that we were going to move forward with only B and C or we we're going to move forward with only D and here are the reasons. Um, we also started um, presenting the designs in the context of the metrics. So this is where having that shared understanding um, in the first step and the common metric becomes important because if I go in with option B and I say this moves the needle positively by five points and therefore meets the goal, you can't really de debate it for five hours. You stop having those interactions um, that are based on subjective information and start talking to people with a narrative that's relevant to them. Once I had successfully done those um, things, I started to be able to have really good positive interaction with various teams. I was able to speak to people from data and give them information in the way that they wanted, all the numbers in the world, or I was able to speak to marketers and not focus on little things. We were able to look at big journeys, big steps, things that were really going to move the baseline. Um, using that expertise that I have in understanding human behavior, I was able to bring that into my interaction. So for instance, if you think about, if you go into a meeting with a person that you like, and they say, Chimmy, I just had one or two thoughts about your designs. You're positive. You're like, oh yes, please, let me know. If you go into a meeting with someone you don't like, as they're forming the words, I have a few thoughts. You're like, right. Always the one or two thoughts, right? And so you're ready, you're defensive. There's nothing they can say in that meeting that will be positive. You really need to, and using these techniques also distances yourself from your design. If your design does not meet the common goal or the shared metric, then you can't present it. Suddenly, I started looking forward to those design review sessions. I like working with other people in marketing. I like working with visual designers. I'm able to communicate and trust me, Communication. I think for the first nine years of my career, every performance review I got might need to work on your communication skills, Jimmy. Might need to improve that a tad. So I'm not perfect, but I'm doing much better. And the last time I had a shouting match with any of my bosses was in 2016. <laughs> I think I might be.